Pushkin. In September, Ben Gibbard, the founder of Death Cab for Cutie, will set out on a nationwide tour to celebrate two very different albums that have come to define his career. Both albums came out in 2003. The first was called Give Up, and it was a collaboration with his friend and producer Jimmy Tamborello. They'd made it while Gibbard was taking a break from the relentless cycle of touring and releasing music with Death Cab. They called their new band The Postal Service. Give Up steadily built momentum, found critical acclaim, and eventually became Gibbard's first platinum-selling record. Musically, the Postal Service incorporated various synth and new wave-inspired elements behind Gibbard's confessional songwriting style, which set a precedent for many of the indie and electronic releases over the following decade. Later that same year, Gibbard went back to his band roots and released Death Cab for Cutie's breakthrough album, Transatlanticism. This fall, Gibbard and his band will play both Transatlanticism and Give Up in their entirety. For someone who listened to both of these records incessantly in 2003 and 2004, I'm excited to say he'll also play three acoustic renditions of songs from those classic records in this episode. In today's episode, I also talked to Ben Gibbard about the conditions that led to the most successful year of his career, and he gets candid about the woman who inspired multiple songs on Transatlanticism, including the brutally honest tiny vessels this is broken record liner notes for the digital age i'm justin richmond just a quick note here you can listen to all of the music mentioned in this episode on our playlist which you can find a link to in the show notes for licensing reasons each time a song is referenced in this episode you'll hear this sound effect all right here's my interview with ben gibbard Man, thanks for doing this. Oh, dude, I'm stoked to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, I can't believe it's been 20 years since both of these records, Translanticism and the Postal Service record. Yeah, time certainly seems to be moving quicker the older I get. I felt like just yesterday we passed the 10-year anniversary. That that really does feel like yesterday. That tour, I went to, I saw that tour, and that feels literally like yesterday or a year ago or two. You know, not ten. Yeah, well, I think we get a pass for the pandemic. I, I think I'm I'm now referring to things that happened in my life as if they happened six months ago, but they happened in the fall of 2019. Time has become this very amorphous kind of element in my life since the pandemic, and I think it may, might be one of the reasons that ten years ago does feel like it wasn't that long ago. The funny thing is, for me, was in hindsight, understanding that you felt that this period of your life, 2003, was was also pretty special because it was special for my relationship to your music. I had stray death cab tracks leading up to the Postal Service record release. But I remember my 13th birthday being at a record store and the guy being like, you need to check out this Postal Service record. I've never heard of it. He goes, this is this is Ben, this is ben Gibbard from Death Cab for Cutie. I go, really? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm game to, and he's like, you know, he's got beats behind him. I remember him explaining it to me, and it sounded like the weirdest thing, but he wouldn't let me leave. I, I think I bought something else just in case I didn't like it, but he wouldn't let me leave without also buying that. I think my mom gave me some money, bought it, took it home, put it on, and from those first opening chords of The District Sleeps Alone, my mind was blown. It was hard to believe, to process that it, it was you from Death Cab for Cutie making this kind of music. What were the first songs you wrote for that record? I, I think that the first thing we did might have been District Sleeps Alone Tonight, the first song on the record. Because the, the project had kind of come out of Jimmy and my collaboration for his record that he did under the name Didn't Tell. And he had a bunch of people doing guest vocals on it. And uh, through a mutual friend, he got a hold of me and asked me to do a tune with him. And that went so well that we just kind of decided like, well, why, yeah, do you want to do like an EP of this or like do some more songs? This was kind of relatively effortless and really fun. So I believe it was, I believe District was the first thing that he sent me. And yeah, we were just kind of off and running. You know, the interesting thing about Give Up to me is that there, there weren't any other songs recorded for it. It was literally just those songs that we had were the record. And we were, you know, I, I believe that we had signed to Sub Pop based off of that Didn't Tell song. And I believe The District Sleeps Alone Tonight and maybe one other song like Sleeping In or something like that. Um, but we we basically had a deal with Sub Pop before we had a record. Did you guys approach Sub Pop or had they just happened to hear some of the stuff? 
Well, Tony Keywell, who was doing A&R for them at the time, who's now still with the company, but I think, I believe he's a vice president or something. Jimmy and Tony had gone to Loyola University together and they mm. were DJs at KXLU. Right, Tony from Sub Pop, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So Tony had gotten word of the project from Jimmy, just them being friends. And uh, my understanding of it was that Tony took some of these early demos in and just said, hey, this is, you know, Ben from Death Cab, Jimmy from Dentel, they're doing a record, you know, should we put it out? And, you know, everybody, at, at least enough people agreed to say yes, that we ended up signing with Sub Pop. So that was, I mean, looking back on it, as I'm, even as I'm telling the story right now, it seems, I still kind of can't believe that it happened that way. That's not how bands tend to get signed. Right. I mean, maybe maybe more so now than before in the sense that you can put out a song on Bandcamp or on YouTube or SoundCloud or whatever, and somebody can find it and then it might end in some kind of record deal. But in 2001, 2002, it, that's not how shit went down. So, you know, at that time, if you were in a band, you were playing shows, you had a repertoire of material and maybe somebody from a label saw you and then we we're like, you guys are great. We should do a record together. But it's almost as if the way the Pulse Service ended up on Sub Pop, you know, was, is more the way in which maybe sometimes people get signed now than it was 20 years ago. Well, it's also like was way ahead of the way that people make music. <laughs> you know, it's much more akin to the way people make music now. In 2003, that record felt it felt like we hadn't heard anything like that record before. And then by like 2010, it felt like that was kind of the way a lot of people were making music, like like uh, singer songwriters, a lot of indie artists, there's electronic elements included. And then you guys were really kind of like ahead of that wave. I mean, there were people before, but yeah. to have done it as sort of as tastefully as you guys did it. I don't know that I'd, I don't know that I'd heard that really. Yeah, I think in some ways we were before our time, not in the sense that we were doing anything radically new, but that electro pop as a medium for indie rockers had not really come into fashion yet. And, you know, when I think about Give Up and I think about influences going into it, I mean, we are referencing Depeche Mode and OMD and Yaz and a lot of Human League, like stuff that was we kind of grew up on as dudes who are now in our mid late 40s growing up in the 80s with this first kind of wave of post craft work kind of synth pop where all of these kind of young people in the late 70s early 80s were realizing they could take this new technology and make pop songs out of it and then it seems from my perspective and you know there might be some listeners who would push back on this i might not be entirely correct in this but it felt like by the late 90s, early aughts, that electronic music had become very much like a connoisseur's music and like a process-oriented underground music. There weren't a lot of people making pop songs with electronics at that point, at least not anywhere near even like what would be considered the mainstream of indie rock at that time. So I just kind of feel like we were in the right place at the right time revitalizing a style of music that enough people were familiar with to make it feel like it was something that they could kind of understand fairly easily, but that had been out of the vocabulary long enough that it felt new and fresh. I would even say, because you're, you're right, like when you're referencing like Human League and, and all those groups that I guess were influences on that project, but you know, there was like tenderness to it that I don't think I'd heard in like electropop before and like a, a focus on songwriting that I don't know. In, whereas in those other forms, it feels like the music wasn't just the track or just the production, but it was really focused around the production. And I don't know, I don't know if it's that it was a combination of Jimmy, who was sort of more the person who had produced the track and you were, who were more coming really from a songwriting, from a band perspective that really helped it fuse the two. But I don't know that I'd heard like electronic music in that way, with the kind of that beautiful, crafted song quality. Well, I appreciate you saying that. As I, 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 I still keep coming back to my position that I, I just think that we were kind of the first people to kind of connect these two, yeah, connect these dots, like yeah. a confessional kind of emotive style of songwriting that I, I guess now have become known for, but certainly was kind of developing at that point in my career. And then melding it with Jimmy's kind of sense of, you know, give up as an avant-garde record by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, Jimmy's coming from an experimental, 
electronic background, but also with this kind of very, a great ear for pop songs. And, you know, there are a couple moments on the record that are a little bit kind of out there, but for the most part, it's a pretty straightforward pop record. Yeah. And Jimmy gets a lot of that credit too, because he was sending me these things. Until I worked with Jimmy, I'd never collaborated with anybody in that fashion where somebody would send me music and I would write melody and lyrics and additional arrangement over top of it. At that time, I was very much priding myself in being like the songwriter in the band, in Death Cab. And as a young person who was insecure, very kind of staunchly uh, protective of my role in the band for fear that if anybody else were to write a note of it, then somehow I would cease being the songwriter, the songwriter. in the band or whatever <laughs> bullshit that, whatever kind of ridiculous position that I took at the time, being a young, insecure person. But with, with Jimmy, I, I found that having had half the work done for me, I could merely just react to what I was hearing. So I would, you know, he would send me a CD with one or two instrumentals on it, and I would put it in a CD Walkman and just walk around Seattle for hours at a time, just kind of humming to myself, or I might keep like a little notebook in my pocket and write a, a lyric idea down or whatever. And I would just kind of go for these long walks and just listen to these tracks over and over again, you know, having no way to record a melody or I didn't have a, I didn't have an iPhone, of course, so I couldn't just sing into the voice notes or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, the songs, would I would just kind of react to what he was sending me and the imagery that the music kind of provided me became a fairly easy jumping off point to write the narrative of the song, uh, which I found to be really liberating. It, it took me to some places lyrically that I had not found myself in. And as I said, it was just it was easier doing half the work. So, you know, it just allowed me the space to, to be writing transatlanticism and also writing my half of Give Up because they weren't in conflict with each other. Like I was at home with a guitar trying to write songs for transatlanticism or what would become transatlanticism. And then I would get a CD in the mail from Jimmy on say a Thursday and be like, oh cool, Jimmy sent me a song. Oh, I'm gonna work on that today. And then I would do that. And then I would go back on Friday and get back to working on the thing I was working on before. And was there any creative bleed between the two? Like, I mean, as you were working on the both simultaneously, were you ever at a point conflating ideas or or having stuff, stuff that you had written on, say, a Friday for transatlanticism, and by the next week you're working on some stuff with Jimmy, and maybe that idea is going over there, or, or was it pretty segmented in your in your brain? It was very segmented, probably because back to being like a young, insecure person, the guys in Death Cab knew I was doing this record with Jimmy. And it, it wasn't so much that that I felt a conflict of interest as much as I didn't want to give anybody in the band the idea that I was prioritizing a, quote, good idea, unquote, to this side project over my main band. So I lived in a particular kind of type of fear that I guess what I didn't want to do is turn in a bunch of demos to the Death Cab dudes and be like, here's what I've been writing recently and have them fixate on one particular song and be like, that one's the best one. And then for me to be like, oh, actually, now that one's off the table because, you know, I used a bunch of the lyrics for this Pulse Service song. So in order to not have that even be remotely an issue, I was only writing to the stuff that Jimmy was sending me and trying to allow those songs to be very kind of separate thoughts away from anything that I was doing, writing for what would become transatlanticism. And you felt like that that process did take you somewhere be segmenting the two writing processes between the death cab upcoming death cab record transatlanticism and uh the postal service stuff and then only writing to jimmy's track that took you to places lyrically you hadn't necessarily been or or hadn't mind before yeah i mean i i, I could never fathom writing a song like sleeping in or clark gable for death cab you know those songs in particular but just something like sleeping in is kind of like uh it's kind of an absurd thought, you know, it's kind of an absurd lyric, kind of a whimsical daydream of a lyric. That... Really resonated with the 13 year old, I'm telling you. Oh, really? Oh, great. <laughs> 14. So that's all great. I was doing was sleeping in. <laughs> that's great. I, I'm glad to hear that. But it's, that's, I, I've realized, I've only realized, I think I realized at the time, but I've definitely gotten an appreciation for it since then that I, I never would have picked up a pen and, and wrote lyrics like I did for Sleeping In atop of anything I'd be writing for Death Cab myself. So, you know, for whatever reason, kind of just the tone of what Jimmy was sending me allowed each song to be 
its own separate thought that could exist away from Death Cab and not kind of come into conflict creatively with what I was doing over here. What do you think lyric, like what in Sleeping In or Clark Gable, what in those lyrics are, are so whimsical to you that you couldn't have imagined, you know, those being Death Cab lyrics? I suppose it's because I couldn't see myself getting, if I, if I was sitting in this room with a guitar writing a song right now, or let's, let's not now, right now in 2001 or 2002, and the idea came to me to write a song about recreating the best parts of a relationship as a way to kind of make oneself feel good about how the relationship had deteriorated, as is kind of the story of Clark Gable. That would seem to me to be a ridiculous thing to write a song about, especially given the kind of music that I was writing with Death Cab, which tended to be a lot sparser, a lot slower. You know, I remember turning in the demo for a Sound of Settling, a uh, song on translanticism, and it was a lot slower. It was kind of like bing, 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 like kind of a more mid-tempo, maybe 90 BPM kind of kind of vibe because I, I had this aversion towards fast songs. I thought that songs that were like up-tempo were not cool or something. And I suppose that is probably a result of kind of coming of age with Slint and Shipping News and Codeine and Low and kind of having oh, yeah. the slow core kind of thing be a large part of my early musical vocabulary that I thought that fast songs like weren't cool. So I would never felt have felt I would have been able to pull off a lyric like Clark Gable or Sleeping In because of just the tone of the lyric against the music that I was writing that was a little bit slower, sadder, sparser. A lyric like that would draw too much of attention to itself at 90 BPM. But when you when it's like in kind of more of like a club banger, it might it might be equally kind of farcical, but at least there's other elements of the thing to focus on if you think the lyrics suck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, it's really, Clark Gable, like I, was, I was listening to it again, obviously, because we were, we were going to be talking, and I was like, man, Clark Gable, I, I'd never picked up on it, and I hadn't listened to the record maybe since the last 10th anniversary, like in a real way where I was really sitting down to listen. But there's like a like a disco groove on the bass going on on Clark Gable. It's kind of like yeah. it was. It's like absurd in a, in a way, but it completely it it all works. I love how eclectic the record is. Yeah, I, I, it's funny with that song. Uh, uh, there's a, a good friend of mine named Thomas Moore who has a, a wonderful label in Berlin called More Music, and you, you know a lot of the stuff they were putting out in the turn of the century, like Lali Puna, Miss John Soda, B Fleshman, a lot of the stuff that was kind of this like early melding of electronics and indie rock. And I remember when I first met Thomas, he was, I believe he was friends with Jimmy or they knew each other in his very German way. He was like, yeah, I listened to the Postal Service record and I hated that song Clark Gable so much. I just hated it. And I was just like, okay, man, like, yeah, it's like, and he's because it was so disco-y and like, I didn't like it. And it was like, and it's, it's, it's funny how like, whenever we play that song, I guess we haven't played it very often, but like, when we were playing on the last tour, and we'll probably when we do it in the next tour, I'll always kind of, Thomas will always kind of pop up in my mind of his brutal honesty about what he thought about that song because of everything about it is pretty over the top, yeah. you know? And it's like... But also not over the top. I don't know, like, but at least not by today's standards. No, know? not by today's standards, but, you know, um, I, it's like there wasn't anything musically similar to it at the time. At least elements of that song had existed beforehand, as we've already yeah. discussed. yeah. But what I thought was so great about Jimmy sent, bring, sending that song in was just like, it was really just anything goes. I mean, there was yeah. no, you know, we we weren't making this record thinking that anybody was really going to hear it, aside from the people who maybe were already fans of Jimmy's and people who were Death Cab fans and might be curious about this project. But before you get the Sub Pop deal, I mean, was there a world where you were just doing this for fun and no one would have heard this like was w did you guys start collaborating with the idea that we will put something out or was it let's just have fun i th i think i mean i've always been a pretty destination oriented person okay. so when we were talking about initially like doing a couple more songs or an ep or something you know there were a couple small labels that were around in our kind of circle of friends that were like oh i'd put that out yeah let us know if you want to put that out so not that everything i've written has been written with the with the goal of releasing it of course like i've written way more music that hasn't been released than has but at that time i, I certainly felt 
cocky enough to think that what we would be making would be good enough that somebody would want to put it out. And I, I guess at the time, I didn't see the point in just making music with somebody else that without without the goal of having it be out in the world. Yeah, it just felt like, well, yeah, if we're making a record, let's make a record. You know, let's let's do it. Let's let's go in with a goal in mind, and if we fall short of that goal, that's fine. But at least we weren't just you know dicking around. I don't know. I I, I love playing music. I love writing music, but I'm 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 very I've always been in awe of people who are professional musicians who make music for fun. If this makes any sense, like yeah. I remember we years ago we played Neil Young's Bridge School Benefit, and over in, and Gillian Welsh and David Rawlings, who are two of my favorite musicians, two of my favorite people. I love their records. They were playing as well, and they were just off in the corner at a party just playing music the whole was this, time. Was this party at Neil's ranch? Yeah, at, yeah, at his ranch. Oh, yeah, man, yeah. amazing. Like the pre-Bridge yeah. School ranch party? Yeah, exactly. And they and they, they weren't playing music necessarily for anybody other than themselves and whomever might just kind of stumble into the room. And I just was really taken with that. And there was a part of me that wished I could have that relationship to music, but I've never had that relationship to it. It's always been a tool. It's always been a tool of expression and not necessarily something to do to pass time or to like have fun. Not to say that I don't have fun playing music, but if you and I were in a room and you're like, what do you want to do right now? It's like, I don't know, do you want to play some kinks songs? And I'd be like, no, I, let's do something else. Like, I don't want to just play somebody else's songs, you know? Uh, well, that's because you don't consider yourself a guitar player, really, right? <laughs> no, I do not. No, I'm which, definitely not. Yeah. Which, is prob- which, was, which is crazy to me, but also it's probably why. Like, I, I think that has to come from, well, maybe not, but primarily it seems in life that comes from the people who fancy themselves guitar players, you know? It might be, yeah. I, I also don't know a lot of songs. I, I don't, I know my songs and then a handful of songs by some of my favorite bands or songwriters, but I, I'm really bad at knowing what the lyrics are to songs that I haven't written. I often get them wrong. Even songs that have been my favorite songs since I was a teenager. Five or six years ago, I was uh, making this record. I was covering all of Teenage Fan Club's Bandwagon-esque who are my favorite band and and this record while I don't think it's their best record is 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 my favorite of theirs because of where it came into my life at the time it did and I was still like emailing Norman Blake from time to time asking him like what is the lyric in that song how does that one go because and I felt foolish even asking him because this I've been listening to this record at that point for over about you know 30 years and um I realized in attempting to play these songs that I didn't actually know many of them. I didn't know what the lyrics were. I didn't know what the chords were. So were you not like when you were first starting to write songs, were you not, it seems like a lot of people, the process of learning to write songs is like playing other people's songs and then like Mm -hmm. just modifying or making them your own or modifying them or changing a couple, you know, like early on at least, was that not Mm -hmm. how you got into making music was doing like covers and things? A little bit, but it was, you know, it was like, a high school band like poorly trying to cover Bad Brains Pay okay. to Come or yeah, yeah. you know, some bad religion song or like a you know, whatever. It was it was that kind of shit. It was like okay. nothing it, you know, I for whatever reason I've never had this desire to pull songs apart and see how they work. Okay. It wasn't like I'm gonna like learn Beatles chords. <laughs> like how did they yeah, be- yeah, I mean I, I guess I did when I was learning how to play guitar, I I, I taught myself from a Beatles fake book uh, originally. And where you would know, have the picture of the chords, of the chord, and where to put your fingers, and like okay, A know, minor nine is like this. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, and I was yeah. like, these guys have really weird chords. <laughs> um, so I guess, I guess, I guess I'm lying a bit. I guess I did some of that, but it it didn't. I, I it didn't feel as if I was doing it for educational purposes as much as I was. I just wanted to sing the song. Yeah. You know, or I just or I just wanted to play guitar, and or and I didn't have I hadn't written any of my own songs. So I guess these Beatles songs will have to do, you know, I guess, I guess here, there and everywhere will have to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you talked about, well, well, first of all, before we go back into the records, tell me about the, uh, about Bridge School and about that, <laughs> that party at Neil's Ranch beforehand. Being a person who's like, I'm not going to go off and play guitar in a corner. It feels like, it feels very much like that's what's happening <laughs> around that weekend. So was it like a weird thing to take part in? It was wild. I mean, at that, I, I think this this was 2006. So we we had in 2004 we had done some touring with Pearl Jam, and N- Neil had come out for some of those shows. And you know, the this tour, if people are not familiar with it, which of course why would they be? It was 20 years ago. 
It was called the Vote for Change Tour, and there were a number mm-hmm. of kind of legacy acts and huge names all descending upon swing states uh, and playing a concert in a particular swing state on the same day. So Pearl Jam and, uh, you know, us, we might be playing in Columbus. Uh, you know, R.E.M. and Bruce Springsteen, are they're playing in Cincinnati. So-and-so is playing here and so on and so forth, right? So that was kind of the big voter registration drive. And, you know, we were going to defeat Bush and everything else. And so that was the first, my first experience, or our first experience with being around like really famous musicians. And that was incredibly nerve wracking at first. And we felt, you know, it's like very, you know, being around somebody like Bruce Springsteen, even just for an hour at some kind of presser was just like, holy shit, that's yeah. fucking Bruce Springsteen. And be cool, man. Don't, don't ask him any dumb questions, you know? And so by the time we did Bridge School in 2006, it wasn't as if being around people like that had certainly not become normal, but we were a, a little bit less self-conscious and nervous. And it's not like we, we certainly didn't feel like we belonged there, okay. but that at least we realized that we were invited there. Right. So people had invited us. They wanted us to be there. So it would be okay to go up to Dave Grohl and like say, hey, man, how's it going? And not have him or anybody else be like, I'm sorry, who do you think you are talking to me? You know, everybody was super cool. Is that a specific thing that happened there? Like, did you meet Dave Grohl there? Uh, yeah, I met, I met Grohl there. I met Because uh, that was really great. I mean, that was an incredible year. I think that year it was Neil, of course, Pearl Jam. Trent Reznor was played with a prepared piano and a string section. Cool. Brian Wilson played, I believe, as well. Um Foo Fighters, if I might have mentioned. Uh, Gil and Dave. I mean, it was, it was just an unbelievable year. And being at Neil's house... Insane. Uh, for those who don't know, you know, these benefit shows, they would occur at Shoreline Amphitheater, South San Francisco. But Neil, the night before the first show, would have a party at his ranch, which was way up in the mountains. And you would go down this single-lane road, you know, sheer drops to your death on one side. And you drive way out there, and then that's and then this is his house, and there's you know there's food and drinks, people hanging out, yeah, and it was a trip. I mean, it was it was a real trip to just take in this scene that you know we had been invited to, and we were very thankful for being invited to, but was clearly above our pay grade, right? <laughs> yeah. So we were just kind of like trying to be cool, trying to not you know make sure nobody drank too much or did anything stupid yeah yeah um yeah. and just kind of take the whole scene in and yeah it was it was it was it was pretty phenomenal it was a pretty amazing thing to be a part of well, having grown up in the seattle area meeting dave must have been pretty crazy right oh absolutely i remember when i was in high school driving down 45th in wallingford with a friend and for whatever reason dave Grohl was just standing on the corner talking to somebody and we were driving past you know, there was no way to get out of the car. We were like on the road, you know. But I remember just like somebody being like, holy shit, that's Dave Grohl, that's Dave Grohl. Like, why is Dave Grohl on the street, you know? <laughs> and, you know, that kind of, I, I, of course, had to tamp down that level of fandom uh, <laughs> when I first yeah. met him. And, you know, I, at this point now, Dave, I we, saw we, you driving off the side of the road. And I, saw I wanted to drive, stop. Yeah, exactly. And... <laughs> yeah, so it's, but I, I think that, you know, and since, you know, over the years, we have become acquaintances and have played some shows together and done some stuff together. And he's a wonderful dude. But I, I think that we all start out as fans, right? Yeah. And, you know, we we become fans of people usually at a very formative, important time in our lives. When music, at least for me, and I'm sure for you, music becomes everything to us. Yeah. It's like everything we want to do. It's everything we want to talk about. It's everything we want to be. And those artists that are so formative to us, you know, in our teenage years especially, you know, certainly in a pre internet pre-social media world we could really be in awe of people and just and be in awe of them for their talents and the work that they have done and not know anything else about them yeah and you know whether it's things are better or worse now depends on i guess how old you are and what your experiences have been but you know a friend of mine at some point we were just kind of goofing off about a bunch of shit and he was he was he's you know about 10 years older than me so he was playing in bands around Seattle when Nirvana was coming up, right? And, you know, we were both fans of Nirvana, of course, but he had said something along the lines of, you know, I think people forget that, like, there were a lot of people in Seattle when Nirvana got big that were kind of more like, those glue sniffers? Those fucking guys? (laughs) Those guys? No, not those guys, right? I mean, there were haters, right? I mean, like, you know, there were people were hating on Nirvana (laughs) or Pearl Jam or whatever it might have been. 
when they got popular, right? But as a teenager, you know, and I'm, as a kid who's growing up on the other side of the water from Seattle, I was able to just be in awe of them and have no context of like, I'm not in a band that's also trying to make it at the same time as Nirvana. I'm not, we're not, an, I'm not an older person who like, whose band kind of petered out and I see these young kids coming along and they get famous and I'm jealous. I'm just in the perfect place to be in awe, to be a fan and to be in awe, you yeah. know? And I, I think that's such an important part of being a fan of music is to have that period and, and try to hold on to as long as you can, yeah. where you can just be a fan of people. And then also, final point on it, at 46 now, there are people that I grew up being in awe of that are in, in, in bands that were so formative for me that now I might be acquaintances with, might be friends with, but I always let them know that I'm a huge fan. Yeah. You know, I'm still asking them questions about that one record they made 30 years ago like when you so you know i know you guys recorded it here but like what was the ant what kind of what was the mic on the thing and you know what kind of guitar you did and you know i think that i'm proud of still being a fan of stuff you know i still want to i still want to look at my favorite bands and my favorite records with wonder and have them hold some air of mystery and if i have the ability to discuss the record or the songs with the people who made them like i want them to know how much those things mean to me we're going to take a quick break and then come back with more of my conversation with Ben Gibbard. We're back with more from my interview with Ben Gibbard. We pick up our conversation talking about albums that were foundational for him. What are the, some of those records for you that are just like touchstones? You know, for me, um, when I was in high school, kind of finding music that be, kind of became my music, it was something vicious for tomorrow, which was... Tree People, for those who might not know, is a band that uh, it was Doug Marsh, who now is known mostly for Built to Spill. It was a band that he was in before Built to Spill or when he was doing kind of the, the early Built to Spill recordings. And that record made a huge impact on me because, you know, growing up in like the suburbs of Seattle or I guess across the water from Seattle, I was of an age where everybody was starting to get into punk and hardcore and straight edge and stuff like that. And there were elements of that music that appealed to me, but I'd always been a lot more moved by pop music and mm. melodic music. And so for me, hearing Something Vicious for Tomorrow, that was a record that was this kind of beautiful melding of like very aggressive kind of an interesting guitar work, but with just really great pop songs. Yeah. like. Uh, Super Chunk was a, another huge band for me. I mean, records like On the Mouth and Foolish, huge records for me. There was a lot going on in the Northwest at that point that I I, I really, you know, uh, Tree People was from Boise, but like, you know, there was a band called Hazel from Portland that I was really, I, I loved. There was a band called Pond from Portland that I really loved. And I, I found myself gravitating towards a lot of this music from the American underground that, you know, I guess, the, I guess indie rock was, the term was being used to a certain extent in the early 90s. Yeah. But uh, it was really just kind of like underground American music being made by people who came up on hardcore, yeah. but that had abandoned it or had decided like, you know what, I want to make something a little bit more dynamic or something a little bit more, has a little bit more to say or whatever. Yeah. And so that was, a lot of that music was the, was the, was the kind of music that was really formative to me in high school because it, it, when you're a young person, and again, coming back to it, insecure, you you know you feel you want to like cool things you like yep. what you like but you also want those things to be cool right and i really did genuinely love these records but it also kind of filled a place in my mind where i could be like oh and also it's kind of punk so <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. but also i mean teenage fan club is my favorite band and when i first heard bandwagonesque when i was 15 you know i i was not i had not heard much of the source material or influence of of that band i hadn't heard Big Star or much from the Birds or or any of the kind of 70s power pop stuff yeah. they were pulling from. But that record just felt so familiar to me and it felt like it was this wonderful kind of extension of the music that was on in the house when I was a kid. But it was kind of like filtered through kind of the Jay Mascus, you know, influence of kind of just like really kind of dirty guitars and I wouldn't it, music was not aggressive by any such of the imagination but it had like a had a grit to it that I yeah. as a teenager really appealed to me it's funny that like I guess with all those bands happening there I mean, grunge right Nirvana um mud honey like all those all those groups and it's like coming of age in San Francisco in like 67 or something so I'm yeah, kind of shocked yeah. that you were kind of did though gravitate more towards a softer more pop sound 
I mean, it's it's evident, obviously, and I think if you listen to Death Cab Records, that you write pop songs. But uh, it's just it's interesting that you gravitated more towards a softer, less aggressive sound. You know. Yeah, and I and to be clear, I loved all that stuff too. Like my the first real show I ever saw was the Sub Pop Ultra Lame Fest in ninety one or ninety two. Like the Mud Honey was headlining, and it was like Super Suckers and Seaweed. I loved sea, still love Seaweed, loved Seaweed, Earth, Pond played. So I mean, I was definitely into that music as well, and it wasn't as if I thought that Nirvana or Soundgarden or Pearl Jam or Alice in Chains were like not cool. Yeah, you know, I love those bands too, but yeah. I think. What I found really appealing was that I could go to shows in Seattle at this small all-ages venue called the OK Hotel, which at the time in Seattle, there was this uh, law in the books called the Teen Dance Ordinance, which basically legislated that any venue over, I believe, 200 or 250 capacity needed to have a million-dollar insurance policy. So that basically meant if you wanted to see an all-ages show in Seattle, it was either going to be at a very small place or it was going to be at the arena. Those are the, those are the wow. two, or a theater, right? So, so many bands came through and would play clubs because we as minors were not allowed in there. So I spent so much of my time as a kid going to the OK Hotel to see a lot of these bands that you know I've been talking about. And what made a huge impression on me was that you'd see them set their gear up on stage, then play the show, then break the gear down, then go over to the merch table and sell their records and t-shirts and then you'd see them get load the gear into the van and drive away yeah and it it might sound a little trite to have to consider that a you know a mind-blowing thing to see but i'm a product of the 80s and mtv and if you didn't live in a big city or you didn't have access to a college radio station i legitimately thought when i was 12 or 13 years old that the only way to be in a band would be if you could play like ripping guitar solos and look like you were in slaughter or something right yeah. i mean like that was because yeah. that was what was on tv you're just seeing it and you're like okay well i don't look like that i don't play like that yep. i'll never play like that i don't actually like this music i guess i can't do it because if i can't do it like that it can't be done yeah but then you see have this experience where you see people doing it themselves real people <laughs> real people and they just they they're they're not they're not changing into a costume to go on stage they're wearing like jeans and a t-shirt at the time probably a flannel or a thrift store kind of shirt or whatever and what seemed entirely unobtainable immediately snaps into focus is something that is like yeah i could do that i I could do that that could be me do you ever do postal service songs in your solo shows oh yeah all the time Yeah. yeah yeah i mean you wrote the words and you wrote to the track mm-hmm. but because you didn't like craft the the track and you weren't like you didn't write the chords or anything i mm-hmm. mean is it was it weird when you first transposed it from the record to like a guitar to do a solo you know some of them work better than others but you know at the end of the day it, there's no way to say this without sounding sounding self-aggrandizing so forgive me um but forgive me. if you think you've written a good to a great song or whatever if you can play it on an a piano or a guitar or a single instrument with a voice can still kind of convey that kind of emotion and power, then, you know, you might really have something. Um, but that's also a function of maybe how records were made in the past and not so much how records are made today. I mean, there or, are... Or it's a sign that there's less good songs today. I mean, that's... A... <laughs> yeah, there might, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one to say that, but I do think that the toolbox that young people are using to make music today maybe does not lend itself as often to picking up an acoustic guitar and playing yeah. a song that has been created in this kind of, in a computer with a lot of interesting kind of tricks and, and uh, not tricks, but just production techniques that are don't lend themselves well to playing a song on acoustic guitar. Yeah. Like, you know, like I, there's a band called Hunter Gex that I think is fucking fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're really interesting and I like a lot of their songs. Um, but not many of their songs, and you know, this isn't meant as a slight. Not many of their songs that I've heard feel like they could be, you know, I, I'm not expecting that, you know, an acoustic set coming from yeah, well, them. You, you know, know, it's not. I mean, I guess when I say there's no good songs, it's not that the, it's not necessarily that the music's bad. I think there's plenty of great music now, but I think even some of the great, a lot of the great music I hear, they're not great songs, and I don't. I think that's fine. It's just, it just mm-hmm. kind of is what it is. It's just like how a lot of the great music I hear now doesn't have like a guitar solo. Like it's just, it's just, I don't know. To I me, mean, it's almost like just like a fact. It's like. Well, this isn't a song, but it's great. I love it. You know, it's it's cool. Well, and I think also what constitutes a song has changed dramatically since over the years, right? Yeah. And 
Again, I, I'm 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 doing my best to not sound like back in my day. Grumpy old man. Thing, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, know. not at all. So but hard it's, like, not you know, to. it's 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 really interesting that you know a lot of songs that are very popular these days are like under two minutes long. Yeah, and they might just be like a verse and a chorus and maybe a verse and maybe another chorus and then we're done. Yeah, and then and on the other side of you have like good vibrations, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or something that's just yeah. like unbelievably sophisticated and complicated with multiple. Changes. I mean, I, recently I, I was I, I I we were on tour and I picked up a copy of Seeds of Love by Tears for Fears, and which is you know I love Tears for Fears, love that record, but you put on you know sowing the seeds of love and you're like holy shit, this is a fucking complicated song, man. There's like bridges after bridges, yeah. key changes, <laughs> modulations. I mean, it is, it's they 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 spared no expense on that one, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I mean. Yeah. But a good song is a good song. If it's, you know, a great song is a minute long that just punches you right in the face and then a great song can be a 20 minute song cycle. You know, it's really just a matter of conveying emotion and, and telling a story, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do you have a different relationship to the Postal Service songs? Do they feel wholly like your song? Like, I know, like, in Death Cab, you were saying you felt very much like the songwriter. And so I imagine those feel mm-hmm. like like the way John or Paul or George feel about their, their Beatles songs. Like, those are their songs. But, like... Mm-hmm. Do you feel that way about the Postal Service songs or do those feel different? They are, you know, legally and spiritually both Jimmy and my and my <laughs> yeah, songs. Yeah. But I've been playing some of them for so long. I've played a lot of these songs more on acoustic guitar than I have with Jimmy. Yeah. So a lot of the a lot of the versions of these songs have become they've taken on a life of their own in this kind of stripped down format. I think at some point in the No Direction Home, I think the the Bob Dylan documentary, he says something along the lines of, you know, yeah, the best versions of my songs were never recorded. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you go into a studio and you make a, you know, you record like a Rolling Stone. And, you know, that's just like, he probably wrote that the week before. And they went in with a guy who had never played organ on a record before, right? Yeah. And they just, and they knock it out in a couple takes and like, all right, that is the definitive version of like a, you know, yeah. Like a Rolling Stone. That's what it is from from now until the end of time. Yeah. And but as a performer, as a touring musician, it, as as it pertains to our songs, I'm sure Dylan probably feels the same way because he literally said it. We've gotten a lot better at playing all of these songs because we've played them hundreds, if not thousands, of times. Yeah. And li- there's little kind of variations and little tweaks have kind of kind of like bubbled up over the years. You know, so I, I'm very much a firm believer in that notion that, yeah, the best versions of anything I've ever recorded has not been recorded. Mm, I like that. It's like, you know, the best version of an acoustic pulse of a song probably existed somewhere in a solo show somewhere in the world. And maybe, you know, these days everything seems to be recorded in some capacity, but maybe it maybe it happened in 2007, right before the iPhone came out or something, yeah, you know? Yeah. Or maybe it's Iron and Wine. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. I mean, yeah. I mean, I. I think when we heard when we heard Iron Wine's version of Such Cry Heights, we we're kind of like, well, I guess that's how I'm playing that now. You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, it's like there's that. Uh, I don't know if you, you might be too young to remember this bit, but there was like an old SNL bit with Eddie Murphy playing Buckwheat, and he's like singing all these songs, and the whole thing is like Buckwheat has a record of him doing uh, standards, you know. And at some point, the announcer says something along the lines of like, you know, when Buckwheat sings a song, it's eternally his, <laughs> you know. And uh, I feel that way about Sam Beam. You know, when yeah, it, yeah. when Sam Beam decides to sing a song, it kind of becomes eternally his. It's like now, such great heights, you know, belongs to Sam Beam <laughs> at least spiritually at this point. It's a really good version, you know. Yeah, it's so <laughs> it's good. A really good so version. Good. That era of music, I felt special having heard the Postal Service record in what in my mind what i considered early and then by the time that record starts blowing up you started to feel like whoa like but this was this was my music this was my group what is, you know <laughs> there was because i think in that time and a little later people were starving for like kind of real people they could connect to there was also this sense of like you wanted to keep things small and for yourself yeah. and and sometimes that that could be i guess you know in hindsight i'm sure that was limiting both to the fans and the artists but was it weird for you when when the Postal Service record took off the way that it did? Oh, of course. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I feel like I can speak from experience because, you know, I I was also once a young person getting into music, right? I think when you're young, you're kind of figure you're finding out who you are. You're kind of creating your identity. We haven't really done a lot of stuff yet. Right? So yeah. how we define ourselves tends tends to be through the things that we like. Oh. 
So if you like something super obscure, that telegraphs to somebody that you are a very interesting person because I'm the only one who likes this really obscure thing that not a lot of people know about. But then when the captain of the football team is like singing Nirvana songs, yeah. suddenly, suddenly, you <laughs> su suddenly, you know, the, the definition of your individuality through <laughs> being a Nirvana fan doesn't seem that unique anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. As I've gotten older, I've been really able to parse that out for myself. And it, it's been interesting to see how that phenomenon kind of works, you know, how it exists in people, right? Yeah. But, you know... I never connected, though, that it was related to that we haven't had many experiences. I mean, it's it's obvious to everyone that that's how we define ourselves is by the things we're into at that age. But I really never connected it to that. It's like you can't define yourself by your job at that age. or Yeah, you, you have know, no job. Like... <laughs> you're, you're going to high school. And so, you know, you haven't probably written anything or built anything or done anything or <laughs> gone anywhere. Yeah. So, you know, so much of our identity, certainly when we're into the arts or music tend to revolve around the things that we like. Yeah. And the more obscure those things are, the more interesting we are as people, yeah. right? Yeah. And but, you know, to kind of come back around to the the response to give up, um when when I believe when Sub Pop was kind of making its calculations as to how many records you know, the projections on what we thought this thing could sell or what they thought it could sell. I think at that point Death Cab's biggest record had sold 50,000 copies or something like that. It would have been the photo album. And, you know, Jimmy's records had done what they had done. I don't know what they had done. And I think they had determined, you know, between, we'll be we'll be in really great shape if we sell between like 15 and 20,000 copies because that's like slightly less than half the Death Cab record. And, you know, this seems like this might be a good good kind of goal. And, you know, we we went out in the spring of... 2003 and did a five week tour of the states playing to you know not many people you know when we get to new york we were playing one bowery ballroom and now we're playing two well, that's exciting and the la show got moved from i think the smell and then it eventually ended up at the palace oh, wow. theater on vine yeah, yeah. so you know it, by the time the tour was ending things were starting to pick up and it felt like the record was starting to have legs, but there was no kind of sense that it would kind of take off the way that it did. And what is still so interesting to me about that record is that, you know, Sub Pop was trying to promote it, but they weren't, you know, it wasn't getting played on the radio. It wasn't, we didn't have like a video and rotation on MTV. It was yeah. kind of like, the record was kind of selling itself. What was the promotional oh. effort around that? Because I, yeah, I don't really remember one until I guess a video gets made and that video was made a couple of years later. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was it kind of got sent through the the pretty standard sub pop promotional machine, which was you know we're, we'll get our publicists on trying to get interviews and try to get college radio to play it for a couple of months, and then we'll move on to what whatever the next record is. Yeah, and it it really became the record just took on a life of its own to the extent where Jimmy and I might be the authors of the record, and sub pop might have been the label, but. It just kind of, it just had this incredibly organic word of mouth vibe to it where I, I don't want to like undersell the work that Sub Pop did on our behalf, but it wasn't as if Sub Pop was spending a ton of money to let people know the record well, existed. They were thinking it was going to be the next Death Cab record, right? Which is probably why they assumed less than the 50,000 that photo album, right? It's like... Yeah, just like, yeah, it'll be, yeah, I mean, people will be interested in this if they're fans of Death Cab, but it's when, you're, when a singer from a band puts out a solo record, like nobody expects the solo record to be... You know, Dave Grohl puts out a solo record. Nobody's expecting it to do as well as a Foo Fighters Foo Fighters, record, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah, so we just kind of, and we kind of, we wrapped up that tour and we kind of thought, well, that's that. That was fun. And then we just get these calls from Tony at Sub Pop, like, hey, the record just sold 50,000 copies. Hey, the record's 80,000 copies. Guys, we just went over 100,000 copies. We're at 200,000 copies. It just, it just snowballed. And to this day, I don't, I don't have, a, I don't have a good explanation as to why that happened aside from the fact that we obviously thought the record was good. The and music was really good. <laughs> but know. there's a lot of great music in the world that doesn't but sell a million copies. it's <laughs> exceptionally good. I mean, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at the top is like people had made, of course people had, I mean, there's Nine Inch Nails, right? Like he's right, he's a songwriter and he does it in like kind of an electronic idiom and, and there's a human league to all that. But it's like, I don't know, it's so, and to this day, it doesn't sound, the record doesn't sound dated. And there's like radio ad records that sound dated to me at this point, you know? And, and you listen to that, and you're like, oh my God, like it's still, there's something about it that is exceptionally well crafted. And same with Translanticism too, which I, I revisited recently. And I think it has to do with the songwriting and the production, both. 
Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I, I have had exceptional timing in my career, and I don't know who to thank for that. You know, I think that it, you know, it's been said a million times that if you could kind of, if you could manufacture a hit, that's all we would have, right? Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like certainly myself in relation to both transatlanticism and give up, I feel confident in my abilities as a songwriter. I feel confident and proud of my collaborators. And I think what, the things we made were, were really good. But, you know, there were a lot of records coming out in that same time frame you know, that were as good, if not better. And, you know, I'm not saying this to be overly self-effacing. I'm just saying, like, we just found ourselves making, we had these two records come out that, for whatever series of reasons, really hit in the culture. And we were there and able to, to capitalize on it and be out on tour yeah. and be promoting the records. And, you know, what, what was also happening at that time was this massive cultural shift where indie rock went from being this underground medium to being i wouldn't i would never say so much mainstream but certainly like larger than it, it had ever been yeah. you know and certainly kind of started to kind of like you know it, it was into the it mainstream was, for sure yeah and in a similar way that you know quote unquote alternative broken in the mainstream post nirvana where there yeah. are bands that bands are playing theaters that a couple of years ago were just playing clubs yeah right so i th i think that we were also both records were kind of spurred on by this larger kind of cultural shift. You know, I mean, there's that famous Sonic Youth documentary, 1991, the year the punk broke. Yeah, right. Which was a very apt title in hindsight. And I feel like a similar piece could be made about 2004. Yeah. And that like 2004 was the year that indie rock broke. Like it went from being this underground thing to... So like a year um, or two later, it's like the killers are everywhere yeah. or whatever. And you Arcade know. Fire. Yeah, yeah and Arcade, Arcade Fire. Fire. And, yeah. and the Shins and, and, you know, it's like bands that if they had come out five years earlier would have been playing basements and small clubs are now headlining Lollapalooza. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Really crazy. Really insane time. What, what what did the guys from Death Cab, what was their reaction to both the music of Postal, the Postal Service and also the success of, of Give Up? Was it tough? Everyone was very supportive while I was making the record. And, you know, Chris actually plays plays some piano and on the record on Give Up. Chris played piano on on the song Nothing Better and he helped record some of the guitars and vocals and stuff. So he was kind of helping me make make some of the record. I did, I did some of it at my little home studio. Uh, but Chris was integral in helping make the record. And you know, Death Cab had come off a pretty grueling period of touring uh, between We Have the Facts and Revoting Yes and Photo Album and it it was a real grind and we had you know, almost broken up and thankfully kind of pulled back from the edge of the cliff and said, like, we need to take some time off. Like, yeah. we we need we need to take some time away from this. It was that time away, which ended up being eight or nine months, uh, that allowed me to really kind of wander creatively and write songs for both transatlanticism and do this project with Jimmy. So everybody in the band was really supportive of it. And, I, and I, when it came out, you know, everybody was cool with it. I think there was a very awkward period between when Give Up eclipsed the sales of the photo album, yeah, and tr and when Transatlanticism came out, you know, I I started Death Cab for Cutie. This was my band. Yeah. <laughs> it started as a solo project, so you know, I didn't think that anybody in the band needed reassurance that I wasn't going to like jump ship to this new thing. That because it it was starting to blow up. I mean, that that I, that never crossed my mind. Right. But you know, there was a little bit of awkwardness when all of a sudden. You know, I'm sitting on a side project that has sold 250,000 copies or whatever. And, you know, we're just about to put transatlanticism out. And there's this kind of like, and it wasn't happening a lot, but it was starting to happen a little bit where people would come to our shows and they'd be screaming for Pulse Server songs. They didn't understand yeah. the distinction. They didn't get that we weren't just going to go into a Pulse Server song. Yeah. And so, you know, there was a period of time in which I think some of, you know, there were some bruised egos in the band around. Understandably. I mean, I think that Understandably, makes Understandably, of yeah, course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, it's like we as Death Cab had joked about selling 50,000 records being indie rock gold, right? Like we were a, we were a hu huge <laughs> band in quotes. Yeah. Like, you know, we were as big as you could be, you yeah. know? And then to find out that not only was there another level, but then I was experiencing that other level with my side project, you know, it, there was some awkward moments there. But back to timing, you know, if we would have put out photo album in 2003 instead of transatlanticism, 
Death Cab would not have become what it became. Right. And the profile of the band would not have risen the way it did after Transatlanticism came out. So yeah. we just were very fortunate to be putting out, you know, what I think a lot of people would consider to this day our best record yeah. as the as a follow-up of sorts to give up. Earlier you were talking about how like before you were a, a verse in a way to like faster songs, like kind of mm -hmm. this like kind of slow malaise kind of a would become known as kind of like a shoegazy thing, maybe. But you know, transatlanticism. I don't know how much of that is down to also getting a new drummer uh, around that time. Yeah, I, the, I feel like um, McCurr added a lot to that record. Was one feeding the other in in a, in a way in terms of the, just the production? Do you think? I, I'm not. I wouldn't say that. You know, there might be some similarities uh, in the some slight similarities just because of my voice and how I kind of stack vocals and stuff like that. But Chris was very much doing his own thing with transatlanticism. Yeah. And, you know, the uh, Give Up was was like a, a Jimmy and Ben production. So we were just kind of doing it ourselves, having never really produced a record before, just kind of flying by the seat of, of my pants. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think when, when Jason joined the band, I think we all, we had tried to get Jason to join the band, I believe, two previous times. Um, our first drummer, Nathan Good, who is a phenomenal drummer. And, you know, when we first started the band and had Nathan playing drums, I was convinced that I'd never, like this was, it was like your first love, right? Yeah. Like this guy plays, he hits so hard and the parts he writes are so cool and like, oh, this guy's great. But, you know, we just found ourselves in a position where we were driving around, playing to nobody, making no money. And he was just out of college and, you know, he's wanted to get married and kind of get a job. And I think there might have been a little familial pressure there as well, because, I mean, look at us. We're these four idiots in a van driving around <laughs> stinky, yeah. you know, making no money. I mean, why would there be a future in that? And I can see that now, you know, yeah. as an adult, yeah. you know, if you were outside of this culture, you wouldn't see that and go like, no, that's a that's a dead end, buddy. Yeah, yeah. So when Nathan quit, we had this uh, gentleman named Michael Shore join the band and he was a phenomenal drummer, great drummer, great dude. But uh, him, he and Chris really kind of butted heads in the studio. They didn't play well together in that in that capacity. So when Jason joined the band, it really felt like we, you know, and I, this might, I don't mean this as a slight to Michael or Nathan, but it really felt like we really, ha we really had somebody that was like on board all the way. Yeah. And for me, as someone who fancies himself at least a little bit of a drummer, I was writing a lot of parts, a lot of drum parts, especially in the early records. And, you know, Jason is one of the greatest drummers I've ever heard, but he also would have no issue with, oh yeah, is that, is that how you want the drums? Okay, cool, I'll play it like that. Yeah. But he'd also be like, but I, I could also do it like this. Yeah. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Or like, no, nah, I think I like it like this. Okay, I'll do it like that. So he was very malleable and he was very opinionated, but without ever being overbearing. Like, you know, when Jason had a strong, Jason wouldn't just, Jason's not the kind of guy who will just chime in with every opinion that he has, but if he feels strongly about something, he will voice that opinion. And for the first time in a long time, I would see when he was pushing back on something that Chris was trying to have him do, I would see Chris really focusing and really listening to Jason and be mm -hmm. like, okay, let's do it that way. And that was, a, that was a new experience for us. Wow. Primarily because Michael and Chris had butted heads so much. There were, there were so much adversarial kind of moments in the studio that it was difficult to parse out who was being unreasonable. Right. It was just they weren't they just weren't agreeing. Right. So once we had Jason, it was like there was no audition. We were just like, all right, let's we let's just get in and start working on these songs. You had the demos for the Translanticism, so, some of them at least, before yeah. before yeah, okay. Yeah. And we just immediately jumped in the studio and started experimenting and playing around with the songs. And in this case with a drummer who was more than willing to like you know, Neil Pert all over the song or to just sit out and not play at all. Yeah. There was, you know, he, he didn't have any ego about his, his, I mean, we all have an ego about our playing, but he yeah. had very, very little ego about his playing in relation to what, what it did in the song. He just wanted the songs to shine. And it's not to say that Nathan nor Michael didn't want that either, but I think that McGurr was very, he was very confident in who he was and, and his abilities and felt comfortable saying like, all right, cool, I'll sit out on this one. Yeah. Or, yeah, get behind the kit. Show me what you want me to play. Yeah. Like, it was very cool with it. It feels like as much as this, like you were hitting your stride as a songwriter at that point, and maybe Chris was hitting his stride as a as a producer at that point. Yeah. It definitely felt like you two were kind of peaking or, or, or kind of finally coming into your own at that point in your respective ways. And then like this new drummer comes in with his energy and it really helped create the sound that 
is Death Cab in a way, you know, which is weird to say because I came into Death Cab like photo album smattering of stuff from like we have the facts of voting yes, but like when you I remember when I heard Translanticism was like holy shit, like you wanted to listen to it. It felt like a whole experience from front to back. Same with Give Up. Well, yeah, I definitely think that you know I've I've gone on record a number of times saying that while I think there's some great songs in the photo album, it's it's one of my least favorite albums that we've made, primarily because of the climate in which we were making it. I didn't think we had enough songs, we but we had to make a record because we had to be on the road. We weren't getting along, and you know, transatlanticism and give up as well, but certainly transatlanticism is the sound of four people who are all on the same page, yeah. enjoying each other's company getting along all with the this, with the common goal. I'm sure that there, of course, are wonderful, amazing genre-defining records that were made under duress or with addicts or people fist fighting in the studio or, or whatever. Like, But it's been my experience that, at least for me, the best stuff that I've ever been involved with has been the product of free and easy communication, love and respect, and the focus on a common goal hmm. and transatlanticism and give up for that matter. But again, very much transatlanticism is a, is a product of that. It's a, it's a record made out of, with love and respect. Uh, we all, it, we, and, and, you know, we would make records. We have made records since then that were not necessarily made under those circumstances. But, you know, I think it was getting close to breaking up and then pulling back and being like, no, we, we all love each other. We really want to do this. We're just a bunch of dipshits in our mid twenties who don't know how to communicate with each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's kind of let's take a step back and take some time away, and then come back at this and and you know do the best we can. We're gonna take one last break and then come back with more from Ben Gibbard. Before we hear the rest of my conversation with Ben Gibbard, let's hear him play Death Cab's song "Tiny Vessels." That's a beautiful song. Thank you. I and mean, there's a level of that song that's biographical. You were living in Silver Lake at some point during the writing of that record, right? The story takes place, <laughs> kind of bringing it around to give up. Um, I was down in Silver Lake working on the Pulse Service record at Jimmy's house. So I'd been seeing this woman for a period of time who I had I'd been obsessed with for a long time. And we were finally dating. And we just we just kind of weren't good together. Mm. It just didn't work. Yeah. And yet, you know, I kind of internalized a lot of the failures of the relationship on my inability to see from a very early point that we were not compatible mm. because I was completely, I was, uh, what's the word? It was somebody that I had been just, I had lusted over for so long. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and then you kind of realize that like sex with beautiful people is, is a lot of fun. But it's not without, at least for me, certainly at that time in my life in this particular relationship, without a really kind of strong connection, yeah. it started to feel very empty. Yeah, yeah. And I started to feel as if I was in it for the wrong reasons. And um, when the, the person who is the subject of the song first heard it, they were really upset, understandably. What I hope comes through in the song is not so much that, it's, it's not an indictment of the person that I'm singing to, it's an indictment of myself. Yeah. Right. And to me, and the real kind of core of the song is in the bridge where it's like, you know, I wanted to believe in all the words I was speaking. I, wa I wanted to like, I, you know, I was, I was over committing. I was trying to convince myself yeah. that I had stronger feelings that, that this was more than what it was, which was just an extension of my desire for this person, physical desire, yeah. rather than a sense of connection away from that, yeah. you know? And, you know, years later we we have, we're on very good terms. We're friends. It's fine. I, I wrote a lot of songs about her. In fact, um, you know, the song Such Great Heights is about her as well. Really? So, yeah. So, you know, she she kind of, she exists throughout these records in a very interesting way. Same with Lightness. The song Lightness is about her as well. Um, so there's kind of a, there's an interesting kind of arc between these records about this person where in a song like Lightness, it's this like, it's the desire, it's the yearning. And then Such Great Heights is the culmination of like, all the feelings and then tiny vessels is the letdown you know <laughs> it's it's the realization that oh i never actually felt this way i just got swept up you know and, and 20 years later she must feel pretty flattered in a way or be you know um, i would feel that way you know i mean if you wrote a song i mean we're friend we're yeah. friends yeah. now so it's I mean, yeah i mean are... i think that you know like any as as a lot of things you know it's like so funny we were just talking a couple of days ago and 
we were both commenting about what dipshits we were when we were 25, you know. It's really easy and to like, forgive what, things. What, <laughs> yeah, and like we're, yeah, I'm such, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a lot better person at 46 <laughs> than I was at 25, you know. Um, is it hard, like a song like that now, like I don't know, I mean, you're going to go on a tour. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'll play that song or not. Hopefully you do. It's great. I want to hear it. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah, well, we're, yeah, we, well, the tour that we're doing in the fall with these records, we're, um, you know, we're playing them start to finish. Are you going to play, I didn't realize so, you're going to play both start to finish. Yeah, that's Amazing. the plan. Yeah, cool. so yeah, so it start. It's it'll, the show will be ostensibly like transatlanticism, start to finish, short break, give up, start wow. to finish. That's going to be a great experience. You know, it, it's kind of a product of uh, I think these this kind of format is a product of a streaming era. In that, I don't remember who was the first one to do these shows. I believe it was some promoters in England like 15 years ago that started doing these. Like, invited a band to play their seminal album, album, and it's kind of yeah, yeah it's kind of taken off and. From a you know you know a concert goer's perspective, it's really kind of a nice experience to go and pretty much know what you're going to get. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, obviously, sometimes you go see a band and you're with your friends, and like I hope they play that song from the third record. You know, we've all done that, yeah. right? And sometimes you're like they played everything I wanted them to hear, or like they didn't play fucking anything I wanted them to hear. <laughs> yeah. Fuck those guys, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in this case, you know, if what you're looking for is hearing these records, you will want, you will hopefully not go home disappointed. So yeah, we'll definitely be playing that one. I mean, a song like that that's obviously highly personal and you, you it's it's by so biographical is it hard to access the emotion of it again is it is it almost too easy and you try not to or how do you perform it in a way that honors the song but without almost going back to that place you were 20 years ago writing it i guess i wrote i wrote tiny vessels when i was 26 i think i'm 46 now so it's been 20 years since i wrote the song and you know there's a part of me that has to exist in that headspace for the three or four minutes that we're playing that song. But it's not its not to the extent of like, have you seen Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox <laughs> yeah. story, where it's like, you know, Dewey has to, you know, he's sitting in a corner by himself and somebody's like, don't bother him. He has to relive every moment of his life before he goes on stage, you know? It's not, it's not quite that dramatic. Okay. But I do find that when I'm performing a song, I do try to place myself back in reconnecting with the imagery that made me want to write that song in the first place yeah. so it's like it's as if you know it's kind of a slightly pretentious thing to call songs like little movies but there is there's a collection of imagery that was in my mind when i wrote that song yeah. and i i find myself accessing that again yeah. i don't place i don't place the narrative in my mind in a contemporary context or in my life now yeah. So it can be a little bit of a, of a head fuck to it's certainly with a lot of my songs be kind of re reintroducing yourself to all of your failings <laughs> yeah. every night. Yeah. But at the same time, I think it's also a really wonderful way to gain perspective on where you are in your life today. Yeah, I play a song I wrote when I was 20 and the lyrics are by a 20 year old. That's not to say that they're good or bad, but that's just who they were written by. Yeah. And there are very few things, thankfully, that resonate in that song that I wrote when I was 20 with my 46 year old self, you know, I'm an emotionally, hopefully slightly developed person, at least since then. So yeah, you, I, I do find myself, I do place myself in the song. I remember who the songs were about. I kind of pay, I have to honor the, honor them for giving me the song by kind of mm. thinking about them when, cool. when I'm performing them. You know, you, you mentioned the imagery involved with writing a song. I mean, the, the, the songs, particularly on Translanticism, I feel are so, um, and it was one of the things that struck me from the very first time hearing it, they are really visual. Like, I mean, just even that theme, tiny vessels and the and the bruise and the leaves and then it goes, you know, it's like a, a title and registration, same thing. And I noticed with title and registration though, on the demo version, the lyrics were a little different. The album version was much more leaned into the imagery of the glove compartment, going for the documentation. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of beautiful imagery on that record. And I love the way that it's, it's, it's all weaved together. It all kind of wraps up. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I... I I think the first three records, be it not by design, but just by default, I think the lyrics ended up being a little bit more obtuse and a little bit more like stipian mm, yeah. than, uh, you know, than Gibbardian in the sense where I, I was, I was writing these, I think when you like kind of, when I call through the lyrics of the first three records, you know, there are, there are some songs that are kind of relatively straight narratives, but there's a lot of songs that are kind of, they're a little, they're a little more obtuse, a little more impressionistic. And I think by the time I was writing stuff for Transatlanticism, I started to really lean into this idea of I want people to hear the song one time and be able to see it. Yeah. To see something. Yeah. Rather than like, you know, like I, I was you know, I was listening to like R.E.M.'s Reckoning not that long ago, and which is a record I've been listening to for 
35 years or whatever and i still don't know what the fuck he's talking about in a lot of the songs right you know and i haven't and, and i've never actually delved into the lyrics and tried to decipher them you know yeah. but then again you put on songs from out of time and you're right there you're like yeah. oh I, it's like you put on losing my religion or low or any of the songs and you're just like wow yeah no i get it i'm here yeah like you know me and honey oh, it's a fucking amazing yeah. song and you know I, I wouldn't say that the lyrics got better for myself or for michael stipe as much as you know the uh, the obtuseness the abstractness started to kind of become a little bit more literal and a little bit more observational and so yeah. i guess when i'm writing a song now or or certainly around transatlanticism you know the idea would be you listen to it once you understand what the song's about but there are turns of phrase that you go like well what did you just say uh, that was fucking cool i like yeah. that but i think on some of the earlier records there are so many kind of obscure turns of phrases that in the less effective moments, it's kind of a word salad. It's a much more eloquent way of saying what I was trying to say. Yeah, yeah. there's these. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's like that, but that's kind of the idea, right? Yeah. You want to kind of like, I, the hope is not to tip too far into bland writing, you know, where you're just kind of writing, I'm happy, I'm sad, this thing happened. Yeah. Um, so that the goal is to kind of, virtually everything I've written since has been like, I want people to be able to put it on and they hear it once and they get it. Uh, but then there's things to go back to and kind of like, well, what did he say there? Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, sometimes I pull it off, sometimes I don't. Yeah, it's incredible. I don't want to keep you too long. Can we do um, a Postal Service song? And Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I got, I think I know which one would be good here. That was really beautiful. Thanks, man. Thank you. It occurred to me listening to that, brought up Arcade Fire earlier, and it, it, not for nothing, I mean, I feel like Give Up, Translanticism, a year later, Arcade Fire's funeral kind of felt like indie rock growing up <laughs> finally in a weird way you know it's like like to your point of like it sort of started to permeate into popular culture that time like the songwriting on these two records are incredible and what a great time for uh for music yeah i mean you know i obviously being a part of it you know it's in my best interest to kind of take that position yeah, as well yeah, yeah. but uh yeah you know it just felt like none of us would have had the careers we have had or the popularity or success that we had without um, all of the artists that kind of laid the groundwork for us in the 90s and even before that, yeah. you know. So there's a lot of bands that I, as you know, we talked about earlier that I grew up with that, you know, I felt to this day still deserve more lip service, yeah. you know. But I suppose that sometimes is sometimes is the uh, the blessing and the curse of being, you know, a cult <laughs> influence, you know. <laughs> it's fair enough. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know. I mean, it feels like decade by decade, so many cult influences are, are kind of getting their due and um i'm sure it'll i'm sure it'll it'll get there at some point yeah well you see the work that numero is doing on behalf of you know a lot of a lot of bands it's my favorite you know, that, music a lot that's coming from like stuff you know from like the stuff like numero's putting out or whatever and you're like like jesus yeah they're doing a phenomenal job and there's, there's a band called rex uh that was really influential and important to me uh and numero you know, there were, there was one a couple of their records that were not available on vinyl, and then lo and behold, coming out in Numero. So I like pre-ordered that shit immediately. <laughs> I was like, gotta have Thank that. Uh, our our friends in this uh, a band called the American Analog Set, who are from Austin, Numero is doing a re-releasing their first three records, which are right. wonderful albums. So yeah, I mean, I, it's 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 really it's it's really kind of heartening to see a lot of this music kind of have a second life, and it's also been just incredibly interesting to see what stuff has kind of been hitting in the culture in a way that I never would have imagined it doing. I mean, like, you know, I love Unwound. I think they're really important to me. I never in a million years thought that Unwound would be a popular band in 2023. I, I think that's fucking yeah, awesome. It's amazing. You know, but it's it's a testament to like, yeah, you make great shit. It might not hit like in the, in. it might be before it's time. You know, there, you know, a lot of this music, a lot of this books, film, culture, whatever, is being kind of is resurfacing and finding a, a new audience and i think that's just absolutely I'm wonderful with you man my biggest fear isn't dying my biggest fear is dying before like my next favorite record gets you know uncovered from <laughs> the 60s or some shit you know uh, yeah exactly i'm still waiting for somebody to put out like a a retrospective of this band called the dovers like who that i loved in the 60s so who, anyway maybe i don't know if it's good for numero but somebody somebody out there listening hopefully do it, someone you know? hears it they do it um speaking of yeah. Analog, american analog set too always i always loved your version of choir vandals it was on the on that, oh, thank you. that home ep you guys did that split ep yeah those guys cool. the, we became friends with those guys i think we met them at south by southwest in 99 it was the first band that we had become friends with outside of our immediate immediate circle in seattle or bellingham 
and uh, you know, yeah, we we did some early touring with them, and and you know, they're friends to this day. I literally saw, you know, I saw a couple of them in Austin. I saw when we were in Berlin. One of the guys lives in Berlin now, so we've we've maintained a friendship over the That's years. Great. Yeah, they're wonderful people. Great band. It's amazing. It's wild. To, it's wild to be in a place in my life now where I'm saying shit like, "Now you got to understand, this was 1998. Yeah, you know, yeah. we didn't have a fucking <laughs> iPhone. You yeah. couldn't just put, dial up a Whole Foods. You it's, couldn't get Uber Eats to bring you food. You know, it's like." I, I've been working with some younger artists uh, working on music here and there and it's like you know it's like I think one of the things that's weird about getting older is that you're seeing the world through you know in your mind you look through your eyes you're still like 25 yeah, or whatever yeah. you know you're still like but then you're around young people and you think like I'm one of you I'm a young person and then you start talking at them and you see them glaze over and you're like oh no I'm like they're dead yeah 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 like I'm talking yeah. about some I'm on some shit yeah. That like they have no yeah. fucking idea, and it's like why should yeah. they? They they don't. It's like yeah. they shouldn't know who Slint is. They don't. Why would they fucking know? You know, they got their own. They got you know they got their own bands. You know, they don't need our God bands. Bless you know, him, man. you know the fucked up thing is like I'm not even. I'm 33, and and so I should still feel a little young, but be, I, I think because I grew up for a fair amount of time, and maybe it's also just because my family was poor. You know, we had the internet much later, and like we didn't even mm -hmm. have like we didn't have cable and stuff. So like there was there was a bit of a fair amount of my life that was like tethered to the real world. You know, I teach a college course and it's like, the fuck, it's like, fuck, I'm, I am a fucking dinosaur to these people, you know? Yeah, man, dude, I, I, I know the feeling, but you know what? Like with age comes wisdom, you know, I don't know if anybody, if anybody wants it, but like, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a trip, man. Uh, ben Gibber, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you taking the time. It's, I mean, and, th and thank you for the music, most of all, more than anything. Oh, thank I, you so I, much, I really appreciate you having me on. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of what you guys do on this pod, so it's, it's nice to be a guest. Thanks to Ben Gibbard for playing live for us and going deep on his writing and album creation process. You can hear all of our favorite Ben Gibbard songs on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Tolliday, Nisha Venkut, Jordan McMillan, and Eric Sandler. Our editor is Sophie Crane. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. <laughs>